these are really remarkable creatures. I mean, if you stand here and watch them long enough, and just they're fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, they are. Oh my. A big yellow. Ooh, and look at those fangs. Todd, this obviously brings us uh, to the question, the similarities between humans and apes, and all the story we've all heard about how we descended uh, from apes. And that has huge implications for, uh, for Christianity, for the Genesis history, for a lot of things. Absolutely. It's definitely a big hot topic in evangelical theology right now is this question of do we have to even bother claiming that we're all descended from Adam and Eve or can we just get rid of them and just go with whatever evolutionary biology tells us is our history. Is that the result of the, the pressure from science that is telling uh, people, hey, no, it's all, it's all there, it's easy to see in the fossil record and all of that? Yeah, I think that's a big, that's a big part of it. I think there's a lot of pressure and there's a lot of disillusionment mm -hmm. uh, with past attempts at explaining these things. So the heat's on. Uh -huh. And so what are we going to do with these? What do you do with the gorilla? Clearly very different from human beings, mm -hmm. but at the same time, among the animals, yes. gorillas, chimpanzees, there's nothing more similar to us than those two things. There's remarkable similarities. It is, yeah. yeah, it is remarkable. But, I mean, in the papers just recently, there is a new discovery, there are new skulls, there is new right. evidence, supposedly, uh, in the fossil record that uh, links all of this. Yeah. What do you see there? Absolutely. Well, I got some right here in my bag. Let's have a look. Ooh, a skull. So this guy is a Neanderthal skull from uh, Gibraltar. Uh, and you can see, I mean, it's, it's got the classic Neanderthal look to it. Very, very low forehead, so we have really tall foreheads. Mm -hmm. The face, the mid face has been pulled out. Mm -hmm. So it's as if someone grabbed his nose and pulled it out. But at the same time, well, it looks very human. It's not anything like a gorilla skull. It's got attributes that make it very clearly, it's very similar to human beings, even though it has this weird forehead. So that's Neanderthal, you wanna hold that one yep, for me? Yep. Okay. We have others that are very different. Oh yeah. Now this one is Australopithecus africanus. This was found in 1947, uh, and it's really different. So you can see really no forehead at all. It just slopes right back. Mm -hmm. Very, very small brain case. Uh, muzzle sticks way out, so the face is sloped forward. And so you might be wondering, what in the world does this have to do with humans, right? It's been so different. Well, the answer is right here. That feature is called the big hole. Foramen magnum is the Latin term, but it's the big hole. It's the place where the brain stem comes out. And the position of this foramen magnum tells us this thing walked around on two legs. It had its head mounted right on the top of its spine so that it could see where it was going. These guys have their brain stem comes out the back. Uh, so their foramen magnum is back here. That's because they're walking around on all fours, right? And so what do you do with this stuff? I mean, there's many more that we could show, many more pictures, many more skulls, and you can see looking at the, looking yeah. at them together, they're really, there's a lot of difference there. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. So all that created kind stuff that we already talked about mm -hmm. with the horses and the cats and the meerkats and how they're different, Archaeopteryx. I can do the same sorts of things with humans. And this is where it gets really cool because I can show again and again and again with multiple studies that I can find a discontinuity between humans and non-humans. So this thing lands on the human side. This Neanderthal here, it's one of us. This thing is not. It is different and I can tell you that it's different. I can diagnose it, I can do the statistics and I can show you with a great deal of certainty this is not human. Now, if evolution were true, you might think there wouldn't be any way to do that, that there should be a gradual mm -hmm. continuum from ape to human, and so there wouldn't be any place to draw that line. 
But even after all of these discoveries, that's what makes it so cool. Even after Australopithecus africanus and all these other things that we have from the fossil record, I can still easily draw a line between things that are human and things that are not. So when we look at uh, Neanderthal man, uh, we're looking at uh, a human, uh, but it's a human that just like we find in dogs, we have a lot of variety of, of dogs. We got a lot of variety of people. So we're talking about a, a human that might be a dachshund or a Great Dane. Sure. Uh -huh. And so how then do we um, think about a creature that obviously was walking upright? Just a different kind of creature, a different color. It's a different kind of creature. Some of my studies kind of indicated this might be related to chimpanzees, but I don't know that for sure. That's, that's not really settled. But this would be just another one of those varieties of living things that God made in the beginning and that survived the flood aboard the ark. Do chimpanzees have that same uh, spinal? No, they have one much like the gorillas that comes out okay. at the back. Uh -huh. So that's a very different feature, which is why this might not be anything to do with chimpanzees. That's still sort of uncertain. The thing that I'm really sure about is the line between this human and this non-human. And this human and those gorillas. Non-humans, exactly. Very easy to draw those lines. So even looking back here at the gorilla, we can see the obvious differences between us and him, not the least of which is that he's in there and we can go home when we're done. But as we've been sitting here talking about this, that gorilla has vomited multiple times and eaten it again is not a typical human behavior. Uh, he doesn't seem to learn that if he would stop eating his own vomit, he would probably stop vomiting. Mm -hmm. He's got that big brow ridge, which is very much a characteristic like this Australopithecus. Um, big canine teeth, which we don't have. Mm -hmm. His arms are much, much longer than his legs, which is a characteristic of a creature that would walk around on all fours instead of upright like we do. So there's a really big gap between humans and gorillas. Even though genetically, he is quite similar. Now, speaking of genetics, we also have Neanderthal genome data that can show us that you and I, right here, we have Neanderthal genes in our own genomes because our ancestors intermarried with the Neanderthals. Now, if you think that Neanderthal is just an animal, that's really hard to explain. You know, how do you get human-animal hybrids? What does that mean for the soul? What does that mean for theology? But if they're just another human, Neanderthal breeding with people, that's not really that big a deal because that's exactly what we would expect people to do when they spread out and encounter other people. They intermarry. And that's exactly what we had with the Neanderthals. Todd, when we read about these discoveries, and no doubt there's going to be the next one will come out in a, in a, in a newspaper soon, how does the average person read that and understand? Are we talking about a human kind or are we talking about another kind? Now, having uh, studied these issues for years that I've worked on this problem, I'm really confident that whatever the next one is, it's gonna fall either into the ape camp or in the human camp. I don't think it's as easy as just, you know, reading a magazine or looking at, looking at a picture and being able to say, oh yeah, that's human, no, yeah, that's not. Uh, I think there's a lot more variety of human out there than what we have really been thinking about, kind of like with cats and all the other created kinds. We've had a very limited idea of the sorts of varieties there are. So yeah, don't panic, be patient, let science do its thing. Let creation science do its thing. And hopefully we'll be able to give a pretty timely update on what is or isn't human. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Todd, what are some of those uh, similarities that we would find uh, between the human and the, the ape and the chimpanzee? Yeah, there's a lot of them. For example, these apes don't have any tails, much like we don't have any tails. When we look down at the genetic level, we find even more similarity. We find startling similarity. Uh, so the question is, what do we do with that? And sort of on the one hand, we could say, well, that's because there's a common designer, right? There is one God that made us all, so it makes sense that there would be similarity. 
ultimately I find that a little dissatisfying because there's clearly a pattern here, right? So I'm more similar to you than I am to this ape, but I'm more similar to that gorilla than I am to the lions we already saw. Mm -hmm. So there's clearly a pattern here that needs to be explained and it needs to be more than just saying, oh, well, God made it that way. It's not terribly satisfying. So that's one of those research areas that we're still working on in creationism that I think uh, is gonna yield a lot of great fruit in the near future. And those are those areas that we need more research. Yes, we those need are the areas more, scientists. We need more research, more scientists, more mm -hmm. students interested, more students involved. That's exactly what we need. Yeah. Well, even though there are similarities, um, it's obvious that there is something radically different about this creature called man. Yeah. Uh, that we would understand is made in the image of God. Right. And so those differences are really huge, aren't they? I, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the image of God entails this idea of being God's representative here on this earth. And part of that then is having dominion and having authority. And these guys don't have that, um, whereas we definitely do. But we also see in the fossil record a lot of variation, right? So it's not always that you can just look at something and say, well, there's the image of God. Sometimes the image of God can surprise you in forms that aren't quite so familiar as you and I might think of as being the image of God. So that just reminds us that the image of God is not something that you can sort of pin down. It's this trait or that trait. The image of God is a spiritual quality that we have that we don't share with animals like that. Thank you.